Hey, Bell, who's that young fellow over there? I don't remember seeing him the last time I stopped in here. Well, that's Joe Rogers, Tech. He's mighty handy with tools and promises to be a crackerjack technician. Wants to know how everything works and why. Something on that work order seems to have Joe stopped. Let's go over and see what it's all about. Okay, Tech. But I ought to warn you, you better be ready to answer Joe's questions. He's bound to ask a few. What seems to be the trouble, Joe? Well, this job won't always start in neutral or park unless you jiggle the shift lever. Now, maybe you can tell me, is there an easy way to find out whether the trouble is misadjustment of the detent plate at the lower end of the steering column or shift cable adjustment at the transmission? <laughs> well, you can usually tell by jiggling the selector lever. Uh, you show them how, Bill. First, ease the selector lever from drive to neutral. You should feel the detent pole drop into the neutral notch of the detent plate at the lower end of the steering column before the selector lever bottoms against the neutral gate stop at the upper end of the column. As a matter of fact, check for selector lever over travel in neutral. After you feel the detent pole bottom, you should be able to move the selector lever a bit more before you feel it hit the neutral shift gate stop. Next, ease the selector lever from neutral to drive and see if you can feel a detent pole drop into the drive notch of the detent plate before the selector lever bottoms against the drive gate stop. Here again, you should check for a slight amount of selector lever over travel before the selector lever hits the drive gate stop. Here, you try it. Tell me what needs adjusting. Okay, Bill. I can feel a slight amount of lever movement beyond the neutral detent position. I can feel just about the same amount of travel beyond the detent when I shift into drive. Now, doesn't that mean the detent plate adjustment is probably okay? Right on the button, Joe. Uh, can you explain why? Well, let's see now. Uh, since I can feel the same amount of over-travel in both neutral and drive, the detent plate at the bottom of the shift column must be properly adjusted or synchronized with the gate mechanism at the upper end of the shift column. In that case, I can probably correct this won't start in neutral or park complaint by adjusting the shift cable at the transmission. You catch on quick, Joe. Uh, do you have any more questions? Well, as long as Bill has that shift assembly on the bench there, I'd appreciate a lesson from you two experts on how it works. You know, on the best way to adjust it, and any tips you might care to pass on. That sounds like a good idea to me. If you understand exactly how a mechanism works, you'll find it easier to make the adjustments, and you'll do a lot better job of diagnosing troubles. You can take it from there, Bill. Okay, Tech. Right from the beginning. Here we have one selector lever that has to control two cables. The gear shift control cable and the park lock cable. In other words, one lever has to do what five push buttons in a separate parking lever did on past models. Right, Joe. Let's start this explanation at the manual shift valve and the transmission and work our way back to the selector lever. As you know, there are six manual valve positions on 1965 models. One, two, drive, neutral, reverse, and park. Now that's the same as the six detent manual valve setup introduced with the console shift models last year. In order to control both the shift valve and the parking lock with one lever, you must have some means of moving the park lock cable after the shift valve reaches the limit of its travel and stops. And that's why the console shift models, as well as the column shift models, Use this control cable with a wide groove in it and a cable adapter with an over-travel spring. I better explain that setup, Bill. On models with console or column shift, the shift cable pushes on the over-travel spring and the cable adapter. When the manual shift valve is in the park position, the cable keeps moving and compresses the over-travel spring. Incidentally, if you tried to adjust the shift cable by putting the selector lever in reverse and pushing on the cable, the way you do on a car with push buttons, you'd only manage to push the shift valve into the park position. That's why you adjust the cable with a selector lever in low and pull out on the shift cable to make sure the shift valve is bottomed in the manual low detent position. You know how to make this adjustment, don't you? Sure thing, Bill. Have someone hold the selector lever firmly in low Pull out on the shift cable with a pull of about two pounds to make sure the valve is in the manual low detent position. Turn the adjusting wheel until it just touches the case and squarely. After that, 
turn the adjusting wheel slightly counterclockwise, just enough to line up the first adjusting hole with the screw hole in the case. Count the first hole that lines up as number one, and turn the wheel counterclockwise until the fifth hole lines up with the screw hole. Install the lock screw, and that's it. You sure don't need a lesson on how to make that cable adjustment, Joe. Maybe not, but I'd still like to have you and Bill explain the rest of this steering column shift linkage. In simplest terms, the selector lever turns the shift tube and moves the shift lever at the lower end of the column. This gives us the motion we need to operate the shift cable and the manual valve in the transmission. So, we connect one end of the shift cable to a pin on the shift lever and the other end of the cable to the manual valve operating lever in the transmission. This lets us move the manual valve, but it doesn't give the driver enough feel to tell what range he is in. The detent ball and detent plate are there to ensure a positive positioning of the shift cable and valve for each driving range. It also lets the driver feel the completion of each gear selection. I can see how it works. The detent ball is spring-loaded, so it drops into each of the notches in the detent plate as the shift lever is moved. But tell me, with that pawl and detent setup, why do we need a gate mechanism at the upper end of the shift linkage? To keep the driver from accidentally shifting into reverse or park. The gate mechanism lets you shift between drive and neutral by simply moving the selector lever up or down. The gate stops you from accidentally shifting past neutral or drive. Since you have to lift the selector lever against spring force to shift into reverse, low or second, there isn't much chance of accidentally shifting into one of these ranges. To get into park, you have to lift the lever even more and against greater spring force. That stop between park and reverse keeps you from getting into or out of park accidentally. There isn't any adjustment at the gate mechanism, is there? No, Joe. For example, suppose the shift lever bottoms against the drive stop of the gate but the detent pole is not fully seated in the drive detent notch. In that case, you must adjust the detent plate to correct the condition. We'll cover that adjustment a bit later. That seems to clear up all the questions I had about the operation of the gear selection part of the shift mechanism. How about explaining the parking cable operation while you're at it? To begin with, the shift cable must start to move the manual valve into the park position before the park lock cable starts to move. We need a cam action to accomplish this. We get this cam action from an actuating pin, which is riveted to the shift lever, and an L-shaped slot in the park lever. Shifting through all ranges from manual low to reverse doesn't move the park lever. The actuating pin simply follows the curved part of the slot without moving the park lever. As the actuating pin moves from reverse to park, it can't turn the corner in the park lever slot, so it moves the lever. This, in turn, moves the park cable. Can I ask another question now, or is Tech going to tell someone to turn the record first? If there's anything I hate, it's a wise guy who tries to steal my lines. Uh, but Joe's right. Someone better turn the record over. Now, what was that question you were about to ask, Joe? How about covering service and adjustment precautions and some of the problems caused by misadjustments? For example, the trouble on that job over there, the one I'm supposed to be working on, is probably shift cable adjustment. Won't that cause other problems besides not starting in neutral or park? It's apt to, Joe. If the manual valve is positioned incorrectly, you can get delayed engagement or dragged out shifts into drive and reverse ranges. Here's why. If the manual valve isn't positioned exactly right, the valve land acts like an orifice. Oil flow is slowed down, so it takes longer to move enough fluid to apply the clutches and bands. Delayed band or clutch application doesn't do the clutches and bands any good. And keep this in mind. If a car won't start in neutral or park without jiggling the lever, correct this condition at once to reduce the possibility of damaging clutches and bands. Here's another possibility. If adjusting the shift cable doesn't correct the won't start in park problem, the trouble may be caused by a valve body that is slightly out of position. How do you check for that condition? The best way is to drain the transmission and drop the pan so you can see what the two switch operating fingers are doing. When the shift cable is properly adjusted, check to make sure that both the neutral finger and the park finger contact the center of the neutral start switch. 
If they don't, loosen the valve body assembly attaching screws just enough to allow you to reposition the valve body. Before you button the job up, make sure the switch operating fingers contact the switch in both the neutral and part positions. Whenever you do, don't misadjust the shift cables so that the car will start in neutral and park if the trouble is an improperly positioned valve body. Reposition the valve body and readjust the cable. Any questions? None on the valve body. But I have one on the park lever adjustment. Why does the service manual specify that you adjust the park lever pivot first? Because the actuating pin must not bottom in the park lock lever slot before the selector lever hits the stop on the gate. Well, what would happen if the park lock lever pivot adjustment wasn't right? If the park lever pivot is over-adjusted so that the actuating pin hits the end of the slot too soon, you can't synchronize the detent plate with the gate. If the pivot is under-adjusted so the pin doesn't touch the end of the slot, you can't synchronize the park lock cable and the detent plate adjustments. Better cover that adjustment, Bill. Loosen the park lever pivot screws. Have someone hold the selector lever firmly and low. This synchronizes the actuator pin position correctly with respect to the manual low stop of the gate. While the selector lever is still held in low, turn the park lever pivot until the end of the slot is tight against the actuating pin. Hold the pivot lever in this position and tighten the screws. How about the detent adjustment? While continuing to hold the selector lever firmly and low, loosen the detent plate screws and align the detent notch of the detent plate with a spring-loaded detent pawl. That pawl must bottom in the detent. I've seen a couple of cases where there wasn't quite enough detent plate adjustment. You can correct this easily by using a file to elongate the detent plate attaching holes a bit more. Now, while you're at it, Bill, you better explain the park lock cable adjustment. First, put the selector lever in neutral. Loosen the cable clamp and pull out gently on the park lock cable housing, just enough to take all of the slack out of the cable. Release the cable housing and tighten the clamp. Whatever you do, don't tighten the cable clamp while you're pulling outward on the cable housing. If you do, you'll load the cable and the park lock lever at the lower end of the steering column. What harm will that do, Tech? If the park lock cable pushes on the pivot lever, the slot on the lever will rub on the actuating pin. This will cause roughness and binding when you try to shift. That takes care of my question, but now I have one for Bill. Just what was the problem on this steering column assembly, Bill? Well, none of the gate stops work, Joe. You could shift into any gear without lifting the selector lever. I found that the selector lever housing was loose on the shift tube. This let the housing drop down so that the end of the selector lever didn't engage the gate plate. This isn't a common problem, but if you do run into this condition, remove the steering column assembly so you can fix it right. Now I think you ought to cover steering column installation and alignment before we sign off, Bill. Okay, Tech. Any interference or misalignment in the steering system will reduce steering returnability. Good alignment and freedom from binding is particularly important on power steering models, which have the intermediate steering shaft and coupling setup. For example, any preloading of the steering shaft bearings will affect returnability. Bearing preload is easily relieved by tapping the upper end of the steering shaft with a soft-faced hammer before you install the steering column assembly. You can accomplish the same thing on the car by using a hammer and a brass drift. Here is a bind possibility at the lower end of the steering column. A park lock lever pivot screw that is too long will rub on the steering shaft and cause returnability problems. Here's something else to watch for. A heat shield that is bent or positioned so that it rubs on the rubber coupling at the lower end of the steering column will cause returnability problems. As a matter of fact, on a steering returnability problem, the first and easiest thing to check for is heat shield interference. You can usually correct the condition by simply lifting up on the heat shield to eliminate the rubbing. However, I've run into a couple of cases where it was necessary to remove the heat shield and reshape the neck to completely eliminate the interference. Uh, you can explain the alignment precautions, Bill. Excessive angularity between the lower coupling and the intermediate shaft 
increases friction and affects steering returnability. The angle should be as close to zero as possible. Another thing, the intermediate shaft should extend to the correct depth in the lower coupling. If the shaft bottoms in the coupling, it will cause a lumpy feel in the steering and may affect returnability. I got another question. How do you make sure the intermediate shaft is properly aligned and centered in the lower coupling? Well, I use this alignment template, Joe. You'll find an exact pattern for that template in the reference book. Ideally, the angle should be no greater than the template angle marked side one. Just make sure the template is carefully positioned as shown. Under no circumstances should the angle at the lower coupling be greater than side two of the template. How do you correct an angle that is too great? Loosen the steering gear mounting bolts and add a 90 thousandth shim under the upper inboard mounting lug. Whatever you do, don't shim more than 90 thousandths. If you find a 90 thousandth shim there, don't add another. Is that all there is to it? Not quite, Joe. Loosen the tow board column support screws and move the lower end of the column to obtain the smallest possible angle between the intermediate shaft and coupling. Hold it there and tighten the support screws. Here's an easy way to make sure the intermediate shaft is centered endwise so it won't bottom in the lower coupling. Turn the steering wheel so you can see the gauge hole in the intermediate shaft. It should be just above the lower coupling boot. From the upper face of the coupling to the gauge hole should be 13 sixteenths of an inch. If it isn't, loosen the column enough so you can move it up or down as necessary to get that 13 sixteenths dimension between the gauge hole and the lower coupling. Just be sure to use this template and recheck the intermediate shaft angularity any time you loosen the column assembly. Here's something else to do. Read the reference book for this session. We've covered a lot of ground in the past 20 minutes, and you should make sure you haven't missed anything. Besides, there are a lot of service details and tips in the reference book that we didn't have time to cover today. For example, there's an easy fix for a loose backup light operating lever. Good information on Imperial parking brake vacuum release valve troubles. And just about everything else connected with a steering column service. Take my word for it. If you use the information in this session, it'll eventually save you more time than it took to watch this film and read the reference book to boot. Be good to your customers. They're mighty important people.